It is an untold story of the Second World War. Peaceful Americans caught up in a brutal war, hunted down by Japanese soldiers. They wanted these Americans. They were showing that they were going to go to any lengths to get them, and if necessary, kill them. A story about families doing whatever it takes to survive. We had to run for cover because we would have been killed. They were killing all American families. About top secret Japanese war plans. The Z plan was a concept for how the Japanese would draw the Americans into a massive, decisive naval battle. And a dramatic underwater mission to rescue the families and the secret documents, carry them to safety without being destroyed. The first depth charge hit us right on top of us. Knocked me for a loop. I wouldn't want anybody to go through that again. The mission saves the lives of men, women, and children, and gives the U.S. Navy vital information. It is a mission now recognized as one of the most daring and dramatic operations of the Second World War. May 1944, an American submarine is on patrol in the Pacific, hunting for Japanese targets. An urgent message arrives. Proceed immediately to the Philippines. The assignment, pick up a group of Americans and top secret documents that could help end World War II. This rescue mission had its origins at the very start of the war, two and a half years earlier. The scenes are familiar, etched in our collective memory. Bombers and fighters smashing the American fleet at Pearl Harbor. Just a few hours later, the Japanese launch another surprise attack, 4,000 miles to the west in the Philippines. Japanese troops come ashore and begin their relentless march to the capital city of Manila. Their goal, to take the Philippine Islands as one more jewel on their rampage through the Pacific. The Philippines are very important to the Japanese because anybody that's on the Philippine Islands is laying athwart the Japanese line of supply to southern China and Malaya. So they simply had to have the Philippines. The islands are home to tens of thousands of American soldiers. But there are many other US citizens, including missionaries and their families. Paul and Clara Lindholm are missionaries for the Presbyterian Church. When the Japanese attack, the Lindholms and their four children immediately become targets. If they are captured, they will be thrown into a concentration camp. The stories I grew up with was people dying of malnutrition and starvation and disease in concentration camps and being separated, you know, the men separated from the women so the fathers couldn't be with their children and, and the kids just, I mean, just horrible stories in concentration camps. Early in 1942 is a bleak time for the Allies. Nowhere more so than in the Philippines. President Roosevelt orders General Douglas MacArthur off the islands. The general escapes to Australia, where he issues his famous pledge, I shall return. The remaining American soldiers retreat to the Bataan Peninsula, then surrender in April. Americans and Filipinos are forced to march to a prison camp 65 miles away. 
thousands perish in what would forever be known as the Bataan Death March. The Japanese are cruel, bordering on sadistic. And the longer the march got, the more dead there was. And I seen the Japanese hit our soldiers in the face with butter rifles and over the head with sugar cane stalks. And I've seen them knock them down, man at them. The sick was what they seemed to pick on the most. The ones that kind of fell behind. And they didn't seem to have any respect for those at all. In the Japanese soldier's handbook, Japanese soldiers were taught that they were racially superior to white people. And their destiny was to be served by white people. The Japanese seized control of the Philippine Islands, one at a time. One of those islands, Negros, will be the scene of an exceptional story and a remarkable rescue. The Japanese reached Negros in May 1942. By then, hundreds of Americans are hiding in the hills and jungles, including the Lindholm family. Just a few years earlier, Paul and Clara Lindholm were in China, spreading the gospel and training other missionaries. But in the late 1930s, Japanese troops invaded China and terrorized innocent civilians. I do remember being impressed by standing in front of what used to be our home. I still remembered what it had looked like and seeing just nothing but a pile of bricks. The Japanese had either bombed it or somehow destroyed the home. As the situation grew more perilous, the church evacuated its missionaries, including the Lindholms. Their next assignment was supposed to be far safer, the island of Negros in the Philippines. The missionaries made home movies, showing happy families living in relative splendor. They all had maids. They lived in nice houses. They had drivers and gardeners. They could live almost like royalty in the Philippines during that time before the war. But the good life ends on December 8, 1941, when the bombs start falling and the Japanese invasion begins. Paul Lindholm, who is both a missionary and a teacher at Silliman University, decides to move his family into the mountains. When the war broke out, even strangers to our family protected us because we were Silliman University faculty and missionaries. So I think my parents realized that they would be safe if they could just hide in the mountains. The Lindholms literally head for the hills. Mother, father, and four children. They live in shacks and caves, scavenge for food, always worrying that they could be caught, imprisoned, even killed. Other American families are in the same situation, among them, the Reals. Sam Real is an engineer for a sugar company. When war breaks out, he joins the U.S. Army. And when American forces surrender, he is taken captive as a prisoner of war, thrown into a military prison camp. Sam's wife, Rose Real, escapes with her five children deep into the mountains. We had to run for cover because we would have been killed. They were killing all American families. 
So we moved from one place to another. The Rial and the Lindholm families don't know one another, but they have much in common. Both families are hiding in the mountains of Negros, and both families expect that the U.S. military will soon recapture the Philippines and life will return to normal. Nobody knew. They thought, well, maybe the war will be over in a week. But the Americans hiding in the mountains have no idea what is in store for them and for the war itself. The Philippines, the spring of 1942. For many Americans, the world has turned upside down. The Japanese military has invaded and occupied the islands. Thousands of Americans and Filipinos are living in terror. Missionaries Paul and Clara Lindholm and their four children are hiding in the mountains on the island of Negros. If they are found by the Japanese, they will be imprisoned, perhaps killed. The Japanese conduct regular raids to hunt down the Americans. When the Japanese had consolidated their power throughout the Philippines, they began a concerted effort to find the remaining American citizens, and there were hundreds of them on the various islands. So they, they sent punitive expeditions into the forest to try to capture the Americans. We knew that there was a danger. We had heard reports of some missionaries from the neighboring island who were murdered after they were captured by the Japanese. The Rial family is also hiding in the hills and is fatherless. Sam Riel joined the U.S. Army when war broke out. He is now a prisoner of war. For all the Americans, life on the run means moving from cave to cottage, relying on Filipino natives for help. The Filipinos prove vital, regularly warning the Americans when Japanese soldiers are in the area. Filipino guerrillas had this system of relaying messages up to people in the mountains when there was a Japanese raiding party coming. They had these conch shells and they would blow in these conch shells and you could hear the sound of the conch shell for quite a while. So they would relay the sound that was the warning sound that the Japanese raiding parties were coming up in the trails and, and there were only so many trails in the area. The bond between American missionaries and Filipinos was forged many years earlier. Until 1898, the Philippines were controlled by Spain. After the American Navy defeated the Spanish fleet, the United States effectively ran the Philippine Islands. Throughout this period, American missionaries arrived to spread their message of salvation. There are entire families devoted to the cause, families like the Lindholms. Most of the Filipinos were Christians, and they recognized my father as a Christian padre. You know, <laughs> he was padre. You don't let anything happen to your padre. You know, they had a lot of respect for him, and he had a lot of respect for them, and we were his family, and so we were to be protected. It seemed like uh, every Filipino we met was very loyal and very helpful to us in all our efforts to evade the Japanese. Not one Filipino that we know of ever mentioned that we had been there or they'd seen us. They all denied our existence. Loyalty runs both ways. Another missionary family is the Wins, Gardner, Viola, and their three young children. One day in 1942, a Filipino arrives at their hiding place with an ominous message. The Japanese have sent him to convince the winds to surrender. If they refuse, the Filipino messenger will be killed. Gardner Wynn steps forward 
and agrees to give himself up. He will spend the next two and a half years in a prison camp. But by doing so, he spares the Filipino, a man he doesn't even know. All the American families rely on their faith, their determination to survive, and an ability to endure hardship. There was a period there where we ran out of food. We had no oil. Uh, the only thing we ate were uh, this one area we came to was, was mushrooms. For a whole week, all we had was mushrooms for breakfast, for lunch, and for dinner, boiled mushrooms. And Bill, the oldest brother, he would go and hunt for food. Bill would shoot monkeys, and that's what we would eat. They would dry it, peel it, hang it. That was our, our meals. The family spent two and a half years in the hills, moving between shacks and caves, always worrying about being discovered. There were close calls, but the Americans avoid capture. Most of the raiding parties, we were notified well in advance by the guerrilla couriers, and they would take us into caves that were well hidden in the jungles. At one point, we lived in a cave, I think, for about three weeks. There is also a constant fear of illness, disease, and death. I came down with dysentery, a severe case of it. Came very close to death. My face had turned blue and my lips were curled up. They knew that there was a pretty strong chance that I wouldn't make it through. They had uh, quite a few prayer sessions uh, around my bed. Elsewhere in the hills, the prayers of the Rial family are answered. After spending a few months in a prison camp, Sam Rial escapes and makes his way to the mountains and his family. But the reunion is brief. Rial immediately joins one of the many guerrilla forces that have begun to form on Negros. Not long after the Japanese had conquered all of the Philippines, a guerrilla movement spontaneously sprang up throughout all the major islands. It was not organized. There was no central organization to it. There were guerrilla chieftains in various parts of each island, and there was no coordination at all from group to group or from island to island. This force grew to, by 1944, a force of over 200,000 uh, guerrillas in the jungles and the rural areas of the Philippines. And that's 400,000 eyeballs and 400,000 ears that were available to pick up intelligence. One of the most effective guerrilla outfits is under the command of another remarkable American, Captain James Cushing. He is a mining engineer who spent many years in the Philippines, then joined the U.S. Army when war broke out. When the Americans surrendered, Cushing refused to turn himself in and instead went into the mountains. Local people who knew him approached him and said, look, we need help here. We've got all these fighters who want to fight, but they need a leader. And so he said, OK, I'll take command of this group. Cushing's guerrillas strike like lightning whenever possible, blowing up bridges and storage tanks, playing a deadly game of cat and mouse with the Japanese. He took over the guerrillas, called a meeting of all the guerrilla leaders on the island, and said, OK, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a concerted, coordinated effort to fight the Japanese. He inspired people. I guess through his, the force of his personality. In time, Cushing's force grows to number more than 10,000 men, Filipinos and Americans. Elsewhere on Negros is another large group of Americans, thousands of prisoners of war. Among them is Howard Crisco. 
we had to take an oath that we would not uh, attempt to escape, I believe is the way he said it. And when we got downstairs, I said, I won't attempt to, I will. Crisco would soon get his chance in an improbable escape from his Japanese prison guards. Meanwhile, American families living in the hills of Negros continue their life on the run, trying to evade capture, hoping to survive, praying to be rescued. They will soon be part of one of the most incredible and dangerous missions of the Second World War. In 1943, Japanese forces control the Philippines. The occupation means hardship and shortages for civilians on the islands. But things are far worse for thousands of American and Filipino military men held as POWs. They are packed into prison camps, shadowed by the constant fear of being beaten or killed by their captors. One of the prisoners is Howard Crisco. Back home in Missouri, he attended high school for just two weeks, then joined the Army. Crisco endured a portion of the Bataan Death March after U.S. forces surrendered to the Japanese, then languished in a prison camp. But for Crisco and six other Americans, July 4th, 1943, is truly Independence Day. They wait for a moment when their Japanese guards aren't paying attention. They left us wide open. When the guards are preoccupied, Crisco and six others hijack a truck and escape without firing a shot. So things just worked out great for us. Then we headed for the mountains. Crisco hooks up with a band of guerrilla fighters and begins raiding Japanese targets. On one of those raids, American and Filipino guerrillas, armed with rifles and a machine gun, sweep down out of the hills to ambush a convoy of Japanese trucks. There's about a dozen of them or so standing up in the back, and I opened up with that 30 round clip, and uh, they all went down for some reason. I'm sure I didn't hit all of them at the same time. After that first burst of machine gun fire finds its mark, Crisco is out of ammunition. When I turned to put this 20 round clip in, uh, I caught a bullet in my right arm and it severed the ulnar nerve. I started getting sick of my stomach. I didn't think I was wounded that bad and uh, I couldn't understand why I was getting so sick. I finally made it back with the, the other troops, and uh, they got me a water buffalo to ride. Howard Crisco's wound is serious, rendering him useless as a fighter. His commander orders him to proceed to the southern tip of Negros to meet a submarine that will take him to safety. American subs have been secretly bringing in supplies and ammunition to support the various guerrilla forces while evacuating men who are severely wounded. In March 1944, the same month Howard Crisco is wounded, there is another event in the Philippines, one with the potential of altering the war itself. A tropical storm rages across the Pacific with gale force winds, lightning, and torrential rain. A Japanese military plane tries to navigate around the storm, but crashes into the sea. Many of the plane's passengers survive the crash, and so does a top secret document. Known as the Z-Plan, it lays out a strategy for total victory in the Pacific. The Z-Plan was a concept for how the Japanese would draw the Americans into a massive, decisive naval battle. And the Japanese would then bring everything they had together to, to defeat, annihilate. That, that word is used in the plan. We're going to annihilate the enemy. 
After the crash, the Z plan and other documents are found floating in the water by local fishermen, turned over to guerrilla fighters, and finally delivered to the American guerrilla commander, James Cushing. When he informs naval authorities, they realize this could be an intelligence gold mine and decide to retrieve the documents immediately. The closest submarine in the area is the USS Crevalle. The sub was commissioned less than a year earlier. It is designed for one task, to hunt down and sink enemy ships. The sub's crew lives for that moment when one of their torpedoes finds its target. When we hit another ship, warm, warm, better them than us. And that was the, basically the response. In 1943 and 44, the Crevalle goes on two war patrols, returning to Australia after each to stock up on torpedoes and supplies. The third patrol is under Captain Frank Walker. In May 1944, Walker receives that unusual set of orders that has nothing to do with sinking ships. They sent us a report and told us to be prepared for a special mission. I don't think at that time we knew what it was. The Crevalli is ordered to proceed to the island of Negros to attempt a risky evacuation. Walker is to pick up Americans and transport them to Australia. There is also mention of some potentially valuable documents. Back in the mountains of Negros, word has been spreading, mainly via guerrilla couriers who communicate with the American families. The Americans are told to start making their way to the southern tip of the island and wait there for a submarine. That was an exciting time, uh, an exciting day for our household but the families first have to get from their jungle hideouts to the southern coast. It is a perilous journey of nearly 100 miles through mountain trails and jungles. We left the Philippines with clothes on our backs. I had a pair of shorts and a t-shirt, that's it. So the rest of the kids, no shoes. I had had a pair of shoes in two and a half years. The trip takes more than a week. It is filled with fatigue, deprivation, and the constant worry that they will be discovered by the Japanese army. But there is also a sense of hope that the information is true, that there will be a submarine, that their torturous ordeal is about to end. Meanwhile, beneath the Pacific, Frank Walker is taking his sub toward a mysterious rendezvous with a band of refugees. Captain Walker complains that he has become nothing more than, in his words, a bus driver. But something else is waiting for him on Negros, those secret documents. Captain Walker doesn't realize this mission could have far more impact than merely sending another Japanese tanker to the bottom of the sea. May 11, 1944, the submarine USS Crevalle is submerged just off the coast of Negros in the Philippines. Her assignment, locate some refugees, squeeze them on board, and take them to Australia. The passengers will be American men, women, and children who have been hiding on the island since the beginning of the war, two and a half years earlier. They have made their way from the jungles and mountains to a rendezvous point on the southern tip of Negros, waiting for a submarine that will take them to freedom. That evening, it finally happens. When the submarine surfaced, it had the American flag on it. And <laughs> I, I must confess, tears come to my eyes even now when I tell the story because my mom almost had tears come to her eyes when she told the story about how everybody spontaneously broke out into singing the national anthem when they saw that flag. 
I think at that point they realized they were really going to be rescued. There were a lot of tears and excitement. One of the most moving moments of my life, I'm sure. The refugees approach the sub on small boats, then start to climb aboard. Captain Frank Walker is handed a box containing the Z plan. He is also presented with an unwelcome surprise. Walker and his crew had expected 25 passengers. In fact, there are 40. And there might have been 41, but one American elects not to be rescued. Missionary Paul Lindholm helps his wife and children onto the sub, then gets back on a small boat and returns to Negros. Filipinos were extremely loyal to the United States and to Americans who had been there. He felt that they valued his leadership and that some of them might look on it as somewhat of a betrayal if he left because it was an escape to safety and they would be left behind to face the enemy by themselves. Here's a guy who had freedom in the grip of his hand, who gave it up to go back and do God's work. It was amazing to me. Many years later, Paul Lindholm spoke about his decision to remain on Negros and what happened when a crew member ordered him to board the Cravalle. He said, I have orders from General MacArthur. I said, I have orders from the commander of General MacArthur to minister to these people yet who have no missionary and no pastor who can move around because they have their own families to take care of. Back on the Cravalle, Captain Walker has to fit in 40 additional people, half of them children, who will sleep on empty torpedo racks. Even more unusual is the presence of women on the sub. Captain Walker gives his crew an explicit warning. The word went out that, that these are women and children and their wives, and uh, we're taking them home, and that's the way it's got to be. They're not, not yours to play with. Loading the passengers takes less than an hour. Then the USS Crevalli sets off for Australia, 1,500 miles to the south. The first night is a celebration. The cooks prepare meat, potatoes, bread, and real butter. And on the second day, a birthday party for Dean Lindholm. May 12th. It was my birthday. I'd just turned nine years old. Captain Walker, oh, it was quite a, quite a treat to see him standing there in the hatchway with the birthday cake with the candles lit. They baked a, a big cake for him, had ice cream, but unfortunately those kids never tasted ice cream. They didn't like it. I was celebrating my birthday, yeah. That is a memory that I still have a picture of in my mind. But the celebrations end abruptly, three days into the journey. Through the clouds, the crew spots a Japanese bomber. Far more ominously, the bomber spots the American sub. The men, women, and children on board the Cravalli are about to experience a submariner's worst nightmare, sitting deep underwater, silently and helplessly, during an all-out attack. If anybody tells you they're not, not, not frightened a little bit, they're not telling you the truth. The noise was so intense, and I was just in awe. In May 1944, 
the USS Crevalle is on its way from the Philippines to Australia. On board, its regular crew of 80 and 40 special passengers, American refugees who have been rescued from the Philippines. Three days into the voyage, the Crevalle is running on the surface, recharging her batteries. A Japanese plane spots the sub and drops a bomb that lands nearby. The Crevalle dives and remains underwater until the danger is apparently over. But the danger is, in fact, just beginning. Through his periscope, Captain Frank Walker spots a tempting target in the distance, a convoy of Japanese ships. Passengers or not, secret documents or not, he orders the crew to man their battle stations. Go down. Go down. Take it easy. Take it easy. He thought, well, gee, nobody ever told me, despite the fact that I have these passengers, despite the fact that I have these so-called important documents, not to sink ships. I have four working torpedoes. I should use them. Some of the officers, I think, try to talk him out of making a a torpedo run on this convoy after we picked up the people because we had too many people aboard. And he, he did make the remark, he says, that he came out here to sink ships and he wasn't a bus for commuting people back and forth. But the skipper makes a serious error. He fails to take an entire 360-degree view. The Crevalle has been spotted by a Japanese bomber which informs the convoy of the sub's precise location. The hunter becomes the hunted. A Japanese warship speeds to the area and begins dropping depth charges. First, a violent explosion that rocks the sub. First depth charge hit was right on top of us. Knocked me for a loop. I think my first emotion when the first depth charge exploded was one of aggravation. But the emotion soon changed to fear as the depth charges exploded around us. Then more explosions, one after another. I think it was about either nine or 11 depth charges they dropped on us. I asked one of the officers, I said, uh, well, how close they get? He said, if they got any closer, we wouldn't be here. I saw red, I saw stars, I saw heavy toolboxes literally fly up off of the deck and bounce back down. The noise was so intense. The women were screaming and they were praying and screaming and kids were crying. Each explosion seems more powerful than the last. The Crevalle is tossed and turned its passengers thrown about like rag dolls. Light bulbs shatter, pipes burst, and 120 men, women, and children are certain the end is near. In a depth charge detected, if you can hear a clicking sound first, that's the detonator going off, you're, you're perfectly safe. But if you don't hear that sound, then the best thing you can do is, is uh, start the Lord's Prayer. Captain Walker orders all motors shut down to avoid detection. The Crevalle is an underwater death trap. It wasn't long before one of the crew members came back to warn us to be extremely quiet. Your life depends upon being quiet. So we all took that very seriously. We had been hiding from the Japanese for two and a half years. We knew that death was right around the corner. We knew enough to keep quiet. They started running out of oxygen on the boat. Temperatures reached 120 degrees. Humidity reached almost 100%. And people were starting to kind of get lethargic from all the, the heat and the, the lack of oxygen, falling asleep. And it was a very dangerous situation for the submarine. It was becoming a little scary not having enough oxygen. When, when you had to breathe that heavily, you say, are we going to get, are we going to get the oxygen? It's just the smell of confinement, armpits, sweat. If you're down uh, and the temperature goes up to 110 degrees and you perspire, you know, it, 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 it breaks down and it smells. 
200 feet beneath the surface, the Crevalli inches along for hours, finally getting away from the enemy ships and depth charges. The crew assesses the damage. The periscopes were out. We couldn't look through the periscopes. Our radars were out. We had no radar. The forward torpedo room was taking quite a bit of water on, and that's where a lot of the, I don't call them survivors, I always call them passengers, were birthed, the women and children, anyhow. The Crevalli is badly wounded, but not dead. The sub resumes the journey, and finally docks in Australia on May 19th, eight days after leaving the Philippines. Almost forgotten during the attack and the voyage are the top secret Japanese documents. The Z plan is sent to linguistic experts for translation. It contains information that gives American naval commanders a distinct advantage in battles still to come in the Pacific, especially off Saipan in June 1944. The capture and the use of the plan by the United States, the Z plan, probably assisted the landing on uh, Saipan uh, by a great deal. Because after reading the Z plan, Michener and Admiral Spruance decided on a very heavy bombing campaign of the Japanese land-based airfield three days prior to the landing on Saipan. A few months later, in October 1944, General Douglas MacArthur keeps his promise and returns to the Philippines. American troops recapture the islands, but the liberation of the Philippines comes at a tremendous cost. More than 60,000 Americans are killed, perhaps a million or more Filipinos. The islands are in ruin economically, physically, spiritually. It is fertile ground for the missionaries to resume the work they had been forced to abandon four years earlier. Paul and Clara Lindholm return. So do most of the other missionaries who had been stationed in the Philippines prior to the war. And many families who had been in business return as well. Sam Rial goes back to work, helping to rebuild the country and its devastated economy. For guerrilla leader James Cushing, the war was a high point. His later life is a series of business failures. In 1963, at age 53, Cushing suffers a fatal heart attack. As for the submarine that rescued the men, women, and children, the Crevalli goes on four more patrols after that mission and finishes the war with an exemplary record. The Crevalli is finally decommissioned in 1962 and sold for scrap. Like any ship, the Crevalli was made of metal and pipes and motors. Those were its guts. But its soul was the crew, the men who lived on board and risked their lives to rescue a band of civilians and missionaries from their own version of hell. It was only afterwards that you, you come to realize that you could have died. I wouldn't want anybody to go through that again. Ever. Their experiences during the war had strengthened their character and kind of made them what they are now. And. Uh, the courage that was everybody showed, you know, it's just a very impressive group of people. There are other rescue operations during the war, few more improbable or more daring than the mission undertaken by the USS Crevalli and her crew in May of 1944. 